triumphant mercy. You know, in another time, another place in this nation, in the world, this is what was called a revival. And it is something that the world itself and our media and our culture does not recognize. But it moves within each and every one of us. And it is alive. And in times in which we feel despair, it is most active within each one of us, within the souls within us. I experienced this myself uh, as a young public defender. I was a very competitive young man. And the problem was is that, you know, a lot of my clients, you know, there were bad facts in these cases that, you know, that were people that were arrested. And I, uh, I didn't like the fact that I was supposed to lose. And I, in fact, at the time, one of the nicest things that was ever said to me was uh, I was signed out to trial with this a uh, very fine young prosecutor, and she said, you know, why do I have to try a case with the most psychopathically competitive man that ever lived? <laughs> and I, I got like a tear in my eye, and I just said to her, you know, that's the nicest thing anyone ever said to me. <laughs> but still I had to live with the revolving door of the criminal justice system. And I had to live with the fact that one day that we might get someone released and we might have a victory that I would see them a month or two later in the box. And where I worked, you know, which was the custody box. And it was like, why are you back? What's going on? And then a man by the name of Bob Herrera who was with a, at that time I later found out, Victory Outreach Church came and sat in my courtroom for three days and I finally went up to him and I said, what are you doing here, this man in this three-piece suit and so forth? And he said, I am here waiting for that judge to sentence one person to my rehabilitation home known as Victory Outreach. And eventually we were able to get hundreds and I, I had the definition of victory redefined for me in my life. And it went back to a time when I was in high school where I read a book called The Cross and the Switchblade. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right, you got it. And it was written by a man by the name of David Wilkerson. And David Wilkerson had started something in New York called Teen Challenge. And it was about the first time anyone ever discussed gangs and drug addiction and what the church could do about it. And in his life, David Wilkerson went out into the streets and he went to everyone who he could possibly meet there. And one day he met up with two guys who are very special to me. One is a man by the name of Sonny Argonzoni, and the other one is a man by the name of Nicky Cruz. And Nicky Cruz was a hardcore gang member. And David Wilkerson and Sonny Argonzoni was a, a heroin addict, and one of the ways he supplied his, his habit was to hold up other drug dealers, the most dangerous thing you could do. And Wilkerson would not leave them alone, and finally he met them in the street one day, and he said to them, you have to come in to my Teen Challenge Rehabilitation Home. You need the love of Jesus. And Nicky Cruz pulled out a knife, and he held it, and he said, if you don't let us alone, I'm going to cut you into a thousand pieces. And David Wilkerson said, and if you do, every one of those pieces will cry out that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
Amen. That's right. Okay? And that was the beginning. That was the beginning of what became, what you've just heard with Teen Challenge, who I've worked with in my career, and you're going to hear more about that in a very beautiful way in just a second. And, but it also was the beginning of Victory Outreach, where they sent uh, David and Wilkerson and uh, Nikki Cruz, who was converted and became a great, and you just saw him on the video, great evangelist. Uh, they sent Sonny Argonzoni out to California. And from that, we have hundreds of churches, the largest urban ministry in the world, using the exact same model for rehabilitation. And in the course of my career, we, I have represented, I don't know, 100 more who, individuals who have been in the rehabilitation homes of Teen Challenge and and, and uh, Victory Outreach. And just recently, for the first time, I found out that judges are finally deciding that, you know what, this might work better than jail and prison. And they're actually, <laughs> they're actually doing it now. Okay, now I'm going to introduce you. I'm going to step aside for a second uh, to my favorite client, I think, of all time, uh, Tamara Matheson. And she's going to come up and give a little bit of her testimony and you're going to see where we wind up and where we get to. Hello. So um, my name is Tamara, and I'm 35 years old. 34, actually. Correction. <laughs> and um, I'm originally from Russia. And by the age of seven, I was an orphan. Both my parents died from drug overdoses. And my brother and I became orphans. And but we were fortunate enough to be adopted by two loving parents from America. So they took us back here. So at 10, I was here, new place, didn't speak any English, new traditions, new food, everything was new. And I, I began to struggle. You know, where do I belong? Who am I? And by the age of 15, 16, I started experimenting with drugs. And I was in my first rehab by age 16 because I just didn't know, you know, why this happened to me or why did I deserve the second chance of such a great family, to be part of such a great family. Um, during my time at rehab, my mom, my adopted mom got uh, pancreatic cancer and I was pulled out to watch her pretty much deteriorate and die. And that just sent me in this like pit of darkness and sadness and mourn but I didn't know how to, you know, because I didn't do it when I was younger, and nobody taught me, nobody walked me. So I just kind of did it my way. So I kind of buried it, became numb to the world, and got addicted to crystal for 12 years. And um, during that time, I needed a way to support my habits, so I started embezzling money from my own family, and that ended me up at Linwood Jail. And that's when I met Bill Dunn. And he came and he saw me. He was actually the first person that came and saw me. Um, and I was in my rock bottom and he said, there's this place called Teen Challenge. And at that point I was like, okay, I'll do whatever I gotta do. But I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And uh, Teen Challenge became my divine intervention. It became a platform where I learned about God and deepened my understanding and love for him because he taught me through my earthly father the how to forgive and how to uh, love unconditionally somebody that's not yours from birth. But, and um, during that time also, I understood that God was timeless and changeless and he was a stable figure. He became a stable figure in my life that I can look up to. And I needed that if I really wanted to change my life around. And also, he gave me the strength to will my will to be authentically whole, to, um, to not be broken anymore. And, um, and I remember when I was in Teen Challenge, and we would get up and we would see it. It's like the closest I ever felt to God. Um, and I came in very hard. Like, my heart was really hard. And I would cry like a baby at Teen Challenge. 
Um, but that's just God's way of saying, you know, it's okay to feel. And he can comfort you during that time too. And uh, God never made us to do this alone. And so it's like places like Teen Challenge that really come and give you that support. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. So our scripture today is from James 2, and I'm actually going to just start at uh, verse 5, where it says, Listen, my dear brothers, has God, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith? and to inherit the kingdom. He promised those who love him, but you, he promised this to those who loved him, but you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, and you are doing right. These are our neighbors. So one of the things that we like to do in this, you know, in our culture is teaching us at this time is to talk about them and what they do and how they are the enemy because of what they do and what they stand for. And the truth is, is that Christ taught us that we love our enemies. And the truth is that we are them and they are us. This is our community. And this particular church embraces that. This church is not afraid to take in the homeless and serve them. It's, yeah, that's right. Because in this culture that we live in, we can say they are not a part of us. They are not a part of our community. That is not who we are. But they came from our community. Nobody knows better than me how it is anyone that can fall. And what we all know and what uh, James will tell us, tell us later in this same section of scripture is because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. But mercy triumphs over judgment. And this is who you are because you are merciful. You are actively involved in taking on a culture of cynicism and darkness and saying, no, we love. We love anyone and everyone. And from the day that we first started to come to this church, and I've said to all of you before, we thank you for embracing us and taking this kid who I never thought would wind up here like this in such a place to lead such a magnificent congregation who serves our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, and God bless you all. <laughs> it's all yours. 